In 2012, the New York Times reported that a dad in Minnesota went into his local Target with a flyer that had come in the mail to his daughter. She was a 15-year-old in high school. And the dad was in a rage, and he gets the manager over and says, you sent this to my 15-year-old? It has coupons for maternity clothes and diapers and baby bottles. Do you want her to get pregnant? Why would you do this? And the manager promised to look into it. He called the dad back two weeks later just to apologize, and the dad said, you know, I owe you an apology because it turns out my 15-year-old is pregnant, but Target found out before she told us. And they found that out not by looking at things that she had posted. They analyzed her purchase history, and it didn't have things like a pregnancy test or other obvious cues. It was a combination of subtle things, like did she buy one more bottle of lotion than normal, or did she buy a big handbag? And by putting her in the context of millions of other people who shop at Target, they can get this incredibly personal insight. But all that technology, is ancient in computer science terms. It's seven or eight years old at this point. What we're starting to get really good at is using this artificial intelligence to predict your future and find out things about you before you even know they're true. One of the first studies in this space comes from Cornell, and they weren't actually trying to predict your future. They just wanted to look at your list of friends on Facebook and pick which one of those was your significant other. The only data they looked at was your list of friends and which of them knew each other. They didn't even include their names. They just looked at the structure of your personal network. And if you think about your network, whether it's online or offline, you tend to have a bunch of distinct social groups. I certainly have this. I come from a big Catholic family, so I have a bunch of cousins, and then I have a bunch of high school friends and college friends and guys I play hockey with, and they all are pretty separate. And these researchers came up with a measure that they call social dispersion, which says that your significant other is probably the person who's connected to the most groups, who essentially covers the full breadth of your social life. And that turns out to be a great guess. It's right like 75% of the time. And so these researchers did their analysis, and a couple months later, they went back to gather a little more data. And what they found, totally by accident, is that if they had guessed wrong for you, that you were 50% more likely to have broken up in those two months than if they guessed right. So essentially, they can tell you if your relationship is going to last when you're in it, and you think everything's going fine. And they didn't mention it, but they can also tell you who a good alternative is to your current partner. <laughs> like, doesn't look like it's going to work out with this guy, but this one over here could be a good choice. And that got a lot of us thinking about, could we do this on purpose? Could we make algorithms that analyze this data and predict people's future? In my lab, we built an algorithm looking at alcoholism recovery. So we went onto Twitter, we found everyone who announced they were going to their first Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Now this takes the anonymous part out of it, so who knows how that screwed up our data. But for all these people, we went through, we made sure it wasn't a joke, and then we followed what they said after that to see if they stayed sober for 90 days. We made sure they said explicitly. So it could be a week later they were complaining about being hung over at work and we knew they'd started drinking again. It could be half a year later, they were celebrating six months of sobriety, and so we knew that they had made it past that 90-day point. We had explicit answers for hundreds of people, and then we built an algorithm that would analyze everything they had done on Twitter up until they announced they were going to go to their first Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. It would analyze that, and it would predict, will they make it 90 days sober? And our algorithm is right 85% of the time. Is this good or bad? You know, we built it to give insight so we can say, you know, it looks like your social circle is full of people who talk about drinking all the time. Maybe you could change that and improve your chances of success. But you could also imagine this being misused. In some states, if you get pulled over for a DUI, you have the option of going to jail or going to treatment. So someone could say, well, just run the algorithm, and if the algorithm says it'll work, you can go to treatment, and if it says it won't work, you go to jail. This is a terrible idea <laughs> to use algorithms like this, because you take away people's ability to make choices and decisions, and the algorithms are wrong a decent percentage of the time, and they also can be biased in incredibly unfair ways. Another example of future predicting algorithms comes out of researchers who are now at Georgia Tech, and they were looking at postpartum depression. So they also were on Twitter and followed women over the course of their pregnancies and analyzed the way they changed how they interacted and the kind of things they posted. And they were looking at subtle cues like adverbs and adjectives in the ratio of first to third person pronouns. 
And all the women changed how they tweeted over the course of those nine months. But the ones who went on to develop postpartum depression changed in different ways than the ones who did not. And the algorithm that these researchers built was able to analyze all of that. And on the day a woman gives birth, predict if she'll go, to, go on to develop postpartum depression. And depending on how much data they include, it's right over 80% of the time. Now, this can be great because postpartum depression is one of those underreported conditions. Women are sort of told they're supposed to be joyful after having a baby, and if they feel bad, that there's something wrong with them, and they won't go to their doctors about it. So if a doctor could push a button when you come in to deliver your baby and know to monitor for you for this, well, that's a great thing. But you could imagine insurance companies or employers using the same algorithm to essentially punish women who have left on maternity leave. Now, these are all kind of creepy examples, but it's not all this creepy. So one example of AI predicting the future that's very new research is in the space of Alzheimer's. So researchers have developed algorithms that can analyze patients' brain scans and predict if they're going to go on to develop Alzheimer's six years before a human physician knows that they're going to develop that condition. And while we don't have a cure for Alzheimer's, there are lots of treatments that are much more effective if you start them before there's serious impairment. And for patients who are going to develop it, knowing six years ahead of time that they might suffer from that condition gives them the opportunity to make choices about what they're going to do with their time. This algorithm is incredibly powerful. It can do so much good. It's right nearly 100% of the time. And it doesn't feel creepy like those other ones. So why is that? And the answer really is because we know how they got the data, and it's pretty protected data. There aren't brain scans of me flying around the internet that anyone can look at. It's something that my doctors have that they're using just for treatment and that I know are protected. The other examples come from data that we didn't even choose to share, that's being harvested from all over the place and for purposes that we haven't approved of and we don't even understand. And when we face this issue, where there are algorithms predicting our future, and those predictions are being used to make decisions about us, like whether we get into college, whether we can get a loan, whether we get insurance. We don't know where the data came from. We don't even know if the algorithms are being run. And if we do know, we don't get any information about their accuracy or their fairness. We can feel powerless in the face of this technology. I think that's something that we have to fight against. The algorithms themselves aren't the problem. They can give us useful insight to make decisions. The problem is really the people and the organizations who are either uninformed or lazy and abdicate their responsibilities by treating these algorithms like they're oracles of truth instead of flawed but useful tools to help them make decisions. That's the thing that we have to fight against. I believe we should have the right to control our data and to know when it's feeding these algorithms. We should be able to have it deleted. We should have a right to know when these algorithms are being used and to see information on how accurate they are and how fair they are, to see if they're biased against race or gender or religion or other factors. And any company that's using them should have to tell us how it fits into their decision-making process and how they account for the fact that these algorithms are wrong 10 or even 20% of the time. To get those rights, we have to fight for them. We need to go to these companies and demand that they give us answers. And if they won't give us those answers, we have to go to people and institutions in power to help them get those answers for us. That means finding organizations that will take on companies who keep this data and their algorithms in dark server rooms and won't talk about it. It means going to journalists when we find out these algorithms are being used and asking them to investigate. And it absolutely means talking to your legislators on every level to demand that we get a right to control our data and to audit and understand when these algorithms are predicting our future and that's being used to make decisions for us. It's going to be a battle to get that, because right now, these very powerful algorithms are in the hands of companies who have basically no motivation other than to make money and get more power for themselves. But they can be pushed to behave in a way that's responsible and helpful for us as individuals and for us as a society. I believe, with effort, we can rebuild our right to control data among ourselves. And that's a future that I predict we can achieve if we all work together. Thank you. <laughs>